Welcome, everybody. I'm Gustavo Tolosa, and I am hosting, as I do every week, the Live with Dr. McDougall webinars. And today is that time of the month when we have our one of our favorite guests here, and it's Dr. Doug Lyle, the psychologist um, in, uh, the, in residence, we could say, for the McDougall program. He's also at uh, True North uh, Health Center, and uh, he's the author of The Pleasure Trap. So I want you to formally welcome you, Dr. Lyle. How are you doing today? Thank you. Great to see you again, Gustavo. Yeah, all right. Very good. I'm very glad to see you. I'm very glad to see everybody joining in. And uh, today we have a sort, sort of a special webinar where you're going to talk about some different topics and ideas that you want to share with us. Sure. There's all kinds of things that, that we could talk about. There's a lot of different questions that come over and over again uh, as people try to pursue healthy living and, and they have successes and then they have struggles. And so uh, one concept that is, is useful to think about is balance. And what we're going to talk about for a second first before we get to balance is to help you understand a little bit of, of why healthy living uh, requires vigilance and it can be a struggle, it can be a challenge, and why we will often stumble and have to pick ourselves up. And the reason for that is that what we're attempting to do is to try to live um, with instincts that were designed for an environment of natural food, scarcity, uh, no electrical uh, light bulbs, and uh, nothing other than uh, energy that we had to put out in order to get everything done. And we didn't uh, have, have houses, and so we were out in the sunshine. So what, what our ancestors all did literally uh, all the time was they ate whole natural food, they exercised vigorously, they, got, they, sleep, they, they slept to satiation every night, and they got sunshine. And this, uh, there was other things too that were uh, in an interesting balance. And that is that they lived in little villages. And so they were never doing too much of one thing. They all had a diversity of, of things that they needed to do socially. Uh, they needed to do things uh, for, for work. They needed to uh, attend to their children, essentially. And so Strangely enough, if we look back at very primitive society, things worked pretty well. Uh, they didn't work as nicely and conveniently as they do now, and we wouldn't choose to trade our way back there for anything. However, the, so many of the struggles that people have, both physically and emotionally, we can trace to the fact that we have situations that now push people out of these natural balances. And sometimes uh, the, it, it is sort of mysterious uh, how or how tenacious these problems are. And people can become very frustrated with themselves and with others because they can't seem to get past uh, what seems to be something that they should be able to master. Uh, when the truth is, is that there's very powerful environmental forces that are that are essentially dictating how it is that they behave. So let me give you an example of a life that's out of balance and the physical and psychological consequences when really nobody's exactly at fault. Uh, it would just be a, almost a an inevitable consequence of a few factors in modern life. Um, I will run into people who have a 19 or 20 or 21 or 22 or 23 year old son, for example. And maybe the young man was theoretically destined for college and now he really doesn't want to go or it turns out school doesn't come that easily to him. So he's pretty smart and his parents were hoping that he would go to college, but he, he went to college and didn't like it very much. It was kind of a struggle. And, um, and so now what he's doing is he's at home and he's depressed because the notion of uh, what he was going to do with his life. His parents sort of had a plan. His mother was hoping that he'd go to the junior college and then he'd go on to the state university and he would do something interesting and lucrative, et cetera. And he's not. 
So he's 21 years old and he's at home and he's still in his room and he's in there playing video games and he's sleeping till noon and he's, he's uh, not in good physical condition. He's kind of getting overweight maybe. And um, he's kind of out of shape and he's uh, eating junk food and he's not really a bother, but every time that there's a little cross-examination or pressure from the parents, he gets upset, he gets depressed, and he feels bad about himself. And mom is shielding him, shielding the young man from dad, who would lay down the law a little tougher, but he's really not sure what's best for his son. And he can see that his son's uh, psychology and emotional life seems to be fragile, so he's kind of intimidated by that to some degree. And this is how this goes on. So this is a very interesting example of a whole bunch of things being out of balance. So uh, this, a scenario like this basically could never have taken place in human natural history. It really couldn't have. So let's, uh, let's look and see one layer at a time, uh, some of the factors, not even all of them, but some of the factors that are involved. Number one, his sleep cycle is completely disrupted. The, the reason for this is that we have electricity. So right away, we've got a problem. Another thing we have is we have a productive activity deficiency. So uh, if human beings and all animals actually have a, a psychological need for productive activity, they need to feel like they're making progress. And in the case of this young man, he's the video games provide him super normal stimuli, uh, i.e. like junk food that that is tickling the mechanisms of his mind that are that are attempting to try to get some semblance of of um, productive activity so it feels sort of productive in the same way that eating an ice cream cone sort of feels like eating but it's not the same thing as eating and you can you can feel that it's a it's an out of balance product and it's an out of balance process to be playing video games for your productive activity. The reason is, is that you can see that you aren't producing anything that's either useful for you to consume, nor are you doing anything for anyone else that they are paying you money for uh, in exchange. And so that, that critical issue of either producing something that you yourself can use or doing something useful for somebody else and that they'll pay you for, these are critical um, processes that human beings are genetically built to be sensitive to. And so if he's not doing those things, but instead we are tickling his instincts and having him feel like he's productive, even though he's not productive, it has that empty feeling of, of essentially junk food for his soul. So his sleep is disrupted. He's getting a, a pseudo productive activity rather than real productive activity. He's eating junk food because he doesn't want to deal with his mom's wacky program of natural food. And so as a result, he's eating junk food. He's not feeling very good. He's uh, eating junk food for his soul and his sleep's disrupted and he's not getting any exercise and he's not actually doing anything useful where he gets positive feedback from other people. He's not essentially uh, ascending in terms of any competition with his peers in in an effort to uh, secure and in, increase his capacity to leverage uh, his his status or esteem for mating. In other words, he's not really doing much. And his depression and uh, lethargy are disturbing to the parents and they're not really sure what to do. Now, what we want to do is we want to reestablish balance. So it almost doesn't matter where we start, but that is the problem. And so one of the things that we do is we kick these people out of the house. Now, mom is terrified of this. Dad's a little worried about it. And the kid, of course, is we're all upset about this. <laughs> but I can assure you, as a psychologist with 35 years of experience, I have had, I have essentially directed many parents to kick these people out of the house. Now, mm. <laughs> okay. nobody has had any horrible thing that has happened as a result. No, okay. okay. Now, let's talk about why this is. So let's really look at 
the what this thing was designed to do. This thing was designed to live in nature under the stars in a pack of people with lions and tigers roaming around the edges and a fire keeping people as safe as possible. It was designed to be getting up at the crack of dawn with a spear and trying to do something productive. And if it didn't do anything productive, it was in trouble. It had to be productive all day long. So you, you can see how easy it is to actually go down and actually apply at the car wash for a job. <laughs> <laughs> this is not the crisis. Okay? No. It is not going to be a horrible thing to have happen to some individual to actually have to get up and get to the car wash at 9 a.m. to work a shift. Okay, so <laughs> this is this horrible tragedy that the that the energy conservation circuitry inside the young man he has no idea how he's going to get up at 9 a.m. or 8 a.m. to actually get this done because he's sleeping till noon. Everything is wrong with with the way it is that he's living because what has happened is uh, you see energy conservation program. In other words taking the easiest possible route out. This is precisely what the, uh, the mechanisms of survival and reproductive success drilled into every animal. Take every shortcut, make it as easy as possible, do as little as you possibly can. So with loving, loving worried parents surrounding the young man, uh, they are allowing him a path of least resistance, which is actually not in his best interest. Okay. So, we see the very same pattern uh, going on. Incidentally, you don't kick them out tomorrow. You give them a deadline, you tell them they've got 60 days, and you tell them that there won't be any negotiation at the end of 60 days. So uh, so they, they can hustle, they're gonna need to hustle things together. That as long as they got a job in 60 days, 60 days from now, you will help them with a deposit for a little room behind some grandma's house, et cetera. And, but you're kicking them out. And uh, I would not keep them in the house and say, well, they can rent a room for me for $200 because that's under the market rate. Uh, this individual is fully capable of being self-supporting. Uh, all it's going to take is to have a horrible, miserable process called a job. <laughs> this, is, this is the horrible crime that will yes. be committed against this individual's life. And, uh, and when that crime is committed, something spectacular will happen. The person will discover uh, energy and discipline that they haven't seen in years. And they will discover something else, which is that they have an internal audience that is watching their own behavior and watching what they're doing with their life. That's, uh, that internal audience is their self-esteem mechanism. And that internal audience will then observe that they're actually hustling and that they're actually doing a pretty good job and they actually earn a paycheck and they've got bills and responsibilities. And when the internal audience observes them execute on these issues, the internal audience will feed them self-esteem uh, positive signals. Uh, these signals cannot be earned any other way other than diligent and excellent effort. Uh, if you do not do diligent and excellent effort, the self-esteem mechanism simply won't give it to you. It's unbelievably stingy and it just will not let you ride for free. So this is how we solve the problem of the failure to thrive young adult who's lost and depressed and doesn't know what they're gonna do with their life. Uh, what they can do with their life is to start to do what every stone age uh, young adult does, which is to pull their own weight. And from there, they can become remarkably motivated to find out that maybe they need to go get a skill but this is a process that takes place over time. So maybe they need to go suffer for a while um, at, uh, at the car wash. And after about seven or eight months at the car wash, suddenly going back to school is a good idea. Now, don't give them a free ride to go back to school. So now we are gonna keep the pressure on so that the self-esteem mechanism continues to fire uh, as we make that a struggle and make them part uh, of an investment. It isn't that we don't help them, but we make them push and do a major part, a reasonable uh, contribution to the effort. And we continue to want to stoke that self-esteem mechanism. So these are, these are the types of things that we do to try to get a life back in balance. Now, the same thing is true with all of us. So when you see something in your life 
that is um, that is sort of nagging and you're not too happy uh, about yourself and you're not too happy with some outcome. What we want to do is we want to look at that and we want to look at it through the eyes of the Stone Age. And we want to see whether we've got something out of balance. And uh, usually what we're going to find is that things can easily slip out of balance in the modern environment. We see how badly things can get out of balance with our young man uh, because he lives in a very benign, wonderful situation with loving parents that are supportive and concerned. And those parents live in an environmental in, a, in an environment of plenty. Um, doesn't mean they have to be wealthy, but all they need to have is enough money to fill that refrigerator. And uh, when they fill that refrigerator and then give him a little extra money, because after all, he needs a little something just because sometimes he doesn't want to eat mom's food. Mom feels guilty. So sometimes the kid needs to go down to Taco Bell in his car that is being paid for. Uh, but as long as he's got his cell phone with him, then we don't have to worry if something bad happens to him. And of course, we're paying for the cell phone too. Now, <laughs> so we see just how amazing the situation slips out of balance and people are a little lost as to what the balance is. And if we don't see what the balance uh, really looks like, then what happens is, is that we're having problems and we're mystified. So the, the, the biggest problem in the modern world, the biggest personal problem that people have in the modern world is excess weight. Uh, we know this, every survey that anybody takes tells us that the number one personal frustrating issue that people have is excess weight. Now, I just want to point out what a bizarre thing this is. Can you imagine we're looking at a country, we don't even have to look outside of our borders. We're looking at a country of 330 million people and 330 million people, the number one personal issue is excess weight. That is incredible. That, that dominates uh, self-help television, you know, discussions about dieting and infomercials. Um, it, it dominates a discussion on the national policy level for uh, dietary guidelines. Like we have to encourage people to do this or that. We're gonna have the government come in and tell, tell us what they should be doing. Um, we, have, we have no end of professionals whose job it is to try to help and assist with this puzzling and, and difficult this crisis. The, the crisis uh, weaves its way uh, past just the personal struggles with having excess weight, having um, uh, uh, literally the, the fatigue uh, that can be associated with this. It weaves its way into every interpersonal situation that people face all day long and in their lives into romances, into marriages, into all kinds of uh, uh, romantic style relationships of all kinds. This is a major player in all of it. Uh, and therefore it is a major issue with people's uh, self-regard as far as this goes. Now, there's very few people rolling around this life that are all completely happy with their bodies. You know, I mean, there's a few people. They're either gorgeous or narcissistic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, but the point of the matter is, is that most people have um, uh, issues, self-esteem issues about their physique, their body, their age, their prettiness, handsomeness, etc. That is situation normal for human beings. But there's a difference between that wishing that we were a little fancier here or a little fancier there versus frustrated with the fact that we're 50 pounds overweight. That's an entirely different problem and it's an unnatural problem. It's an issue of things being out of balance. So how do things get out of balance? Well, all kinds of ways. The, uh, the first way is that the, uh, the food supply is uh, overly abundant. So the truth is, is that our, in our ancestral nature, uh, you didn't have overabundant food. You just ate what there was and what you managed to come up with. And that was that. So already we're looking at an interesting problem that the overabundance of food per se is a problem. Um, I have a, a, a client that has decided one way for her to solve the, the, the problem of systematic overeating 
is to only buy enough food for one day. That's it. Okay, she buys her food one day at a time. She eats that food and then she goes back to the grocery store the next day and buys another day of food. This is the self-disciplinary process that she is essentially mimicking the Stone Age environment with this strategy. Now that's not what we do because we're too lazy. So we're going to fill up a pantry, <laughs> fill up a refrigerator, and we got a charge card that'll work at every every food purveyor you know uh, that we come anywhere close to. So can you imagine <laughs> what a bizarre situation that yeah. we find ourselves in? So we can see that number one problem is that the food's abundant. The number two problem is, is that the food is overly rich. So that's the pleasure trap starting to sneak up. So the overabundance of the food, the, the richness of the food, uh, and actually I will also say the inexpensiveness of the food in many ways, not only the minimal amount of work associated with uh, uh, getting it to our mouths, but also the relatively minimal amount of work to get the money to buy it. So the food is actually remarkably inexpensive. Um, depends on what market you're shopping at. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the truth is, is that yeah. it's actually yes. remarkably cheap. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of the food that people buy and eat is actually quite cheap. Uh, it's filled per, per calorie. It's filled with a lot of oil, refined carbohydrate, uh, all kinds of high fat, et cetera. Now, balance. I've looked at this. Uh, a lot of people will think that they that they um, that the reason they're overeating and the reason they're having trouble staying on a healthy track, uh, they'll have a whole list of reasons why they think this is true. Usually, what I find is that something's been tipped out of balance, and that that's actually the reason, not some of the reasons that they are thinking are the reasons. So. In my own history, I've had uh, my own healthy eating and non-healthy eating uh, tends to go in streaks. And those streaks uh, wind up having a characteristic. There's usually something that is tipped something out of balance. So for example, uh, if I move, so if I, if I move, suddenly things are tipped out of balance. So my normal routine is disrupted. And so now I'm likely to make some compromising behaviors because I don't have things all worked out yet. And then once you start making compromising behaviors, you sort of rattle the whole groove. Um, and it requires a groove to try to stay on a healthy track. Uh, this is it's what I call a deep groove. To try to stay on a healthy track, um, we need to have a bunch of sort of stereotype behaviors that keep us within nice little boundary lines. And if we get out of those boundary lines, um, if things disrupt us out of those boundary lines, then we can lose the deep groove. Uh, just, I see you nodding, Gustavo. Does that make sense for you? Oh, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I can see how for me, sometimes it's traveling. Yes. And no matter how much you plan, things get out of balance. Yeah. You know, and, if, and if it's you're stressed out and there's not a good choice of food, you, it's, yeah. Yeah, these are these are things also a new relationship of any kind, whether it's a new work or a new romantic relationship or something of this nature. Um, mm -hmm. This can tip things out of balance. So suddenly we are under social influences that have changed and we're not ready to manage those uh, in the way that we're managing existing situations. And so we're looking agreeable. We were looking uh, adventurous. We're looking like we want to be one of the group or we don't want to get. We don't want to be a, a wet blanket on top of a new romance. Whatever it is, there can be reasons why socially uh, we start to get ourselves tipped out of balance with respect to our, our food. And now we can the, the pleasure trap raises its head, starts to lure us in. The, um, another thing that uh, can get us out of balance might be that we're on a really good routine uh, that where we have good sleep, good exercise, good food, and then we get injured. And so now our exercise routine uh, goes, goes uh, by the wayside because we've got six weeks where we're going to have to heal something or longer. And then everything starts to unravel a little bit. 
uh, because that whole system winds up being a sort of a defense against the pressure that's coming in from the outside world to try to keep us off track. Uh, in previous webinars, I have described healthy living as you being inside of a submarine and you're about 3,000 feet under the ocean uh, surface and the pressure outside is tremendous and it's trying to get inside your submarine. Uh, the pressure outside is, is all the rich foods and bad habits are trying to force their way inside of your life. And your submarine, uh, if it has a weakness, the pressure is going to find it. And so this is, this is about us maintaining a, enough strength in that submarine and recognizing where the weakness is because that, you know, that's things get out of balance and they find your weakness. So it's not a disaster. We're not going to go down uh, in, in, you know, to the bottom of the ocean because we have a crack in our sub. It just means that what we have to do is we usually have to rise, rise up higher in the ocean, i.e. get rid of some of the stress. So when, when the stress gets enough and it starts to find your weakness and you start to get out of balance, then we need to uh, do what we can to reduce stress. So stress is a fine thing in general. People act as if it's rat poison. It's not, it's a normal part of all animal life. Uh, our teenager sitting in his room didn't have enough stress. And so when we kick him out and go to the car wash, now he's got some stress. That's fine. The, the, the problem is, is that there, what can happen is we can get quite stressed uh, at times uh, for good reason. We have goals that have conflicts and pressures and that it's really seems like it's really worth doing. So we're staying up late, getting up early, pushing the envelope. There, there, are, there are reasons why we wind up under stress. But when you wind up under stress, remember that you are in a submarine and that submarine has a job to do, which is to try to keep all this unhealthy living outside of it. And most people are out there without a sub. They don't even know that there's a problem. So they are just living one Big Mac to the next and they don't understand uh, you know, why they're facing all the health problems and, and issues that they face. And they're really, uh, they are not blissfully ignorant. They are problematically ignorant of the situation. But if you're a McDougaler, if you're a healthy, living, committed type of a person, you're not oblivious. And so uh, you, you recognize that when you wander off course, this is a problem. And uh, and what it's going to take is to reduce your stress as quickly as possible so that you can repair your submarine so that you can then, you know, go back under the pressures that are reasonable for that sub to handle. The, um, so what does that mean? There, there, are, there are several strategies uh, to reduce stress. Probably the number one strategy that, that I find useful for most people is to change the goalpost timeline. With, uh, with a great many personal issues. So if you have the goal that you're going to get your apartment painted and get everything done before Thanksgiving, and then this contractor's got to come and then you have to put in a new toilet because Aunt Millie's coming, et cetera. If we start having that kind of a situation and you start derailing uh, under anything like that, then the first thing we look at is what can we put off? The um, I will have, I, I work with a number of young people, college level, and I have over the years. And college students, a lot of times very conscientious college students uh, are trying to graduate on time or ahead of time. And they, they, they've uh, now got a, a semester in front of them where they've got, you know, four classes and they're all hard classes, but they're core classes and they need to take them, et cetera, in this sequence and they're overwhelmed. And so what's happening is the wheels are starting to come off. Uh, the stress is too much. The submarine is leaking and things are going by the wayside. We're, they're in trouble. And the right solution is to move the goalpost and to move it back. And so 
There's no reason for us to be graduating on time. We can graduate a semester later. We can, instead of, you know, uh, I don't know, going on some backpacking trip next summer that we we're going to do, no, we can go to school instead. And we could just put off that backpacking trip and we can take uh, one less class each semester and we'll take those two classes in the summer. In other words, a great deal of stress, almost all of it, not all of it, almost all stress is time pressure. And uh, it's a strange thing that, that that's what it is. The strange thing about it is the older you get, the attitude, you, you gotta be kidding. Like, why was I rushing around like a chicken with my head cut off when I was 32 and under tremendous stress? Why? Where was the rush? The answer is I was trying to fit too much into too small a space uh, for various and sundry reasons. So now, now when we back up and we realize, wait, in order to maintain a good balance, in order to be able to defend our submarine in the modern environment against the pressures that are coming in, we need to have very good routines, sleep, exercise, taking the time to get healthy food and getting it prepared and getting it in, uh, in front of us, sunshine, sleep, exercise, good food, sunshine, sleep, exercise, good food, sunshine. These uh, with sunshine being the least important. Okay, so sleep, exercise, good food. Those things over and over again, taking the time to do those and not rushing through the process. This is how it is that we, we defend the, the structure of our sub. And when we're in trouble, we can usually find uh, the Achilles heel is somewhere around there. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. And I think that there's Dr. Lyle, it must be so many people that go through this process. Uh, I don't know. I you you've described so many. You've described like at least three or four people that I know uh, with the, with the son uh, yes. story that you gave. You know, it's more common. Yeah, but getting out of balance. It's e easy to get out of balance, and um, in, in our modern day. Yes. So these are, these are just some real basic uh, issues. And this is, you will find the very same prescriptions uh, in my lecture that I'm sure we've done here at some point called the willpower mm -hmm. paradox. And yes. yeah, yes. and so we, we keep finding that the same concepts are turning to us. And there's, um, th there's no magic solution to the, the process of, of healthy living there are little components of a, of a solution that come together and they're somewhat interdependent. And that is that if we're short of sleep, then we are, we are impatient and we're impulsive. And if we're impatient and impulsive, uh, then we're much more likely to transgress. And the more likely we transgress, the more we tease the system into the pleasure trap and the more we tease into the pleasure trap, the more likely that we're gonna wind up there habitually enough that it's going to be a struggle to get out. There we have it. Okay, so this all started with being short of sleep. The, um, if we don't exercise, there can be a, a uh, essentially uncomfortable tension uh, in the system that can be, the system can essentially be uh, under-exercised. And so people that are working hard all day long, staring at a computer screen, moving, moving numbers around, and, and by the time they're done at the end of the day, they're tired and uh, they've had enough. And the last thing they wanna do is to exercise. But what we're gonna find is if they are not short of sleep, they actually have the energy to do it. If they are short of sleep, uh, people will not feel like exercising. And so uh, a sh shortness of sleep will set up, for example, repetitive caffeine use. Uh, and then people are sort of living on, on borrowed time, but they're physically exhausted and they don't know it. So we set up patterns where these kinds of processes are not taking place habitually. Uh, sometimes people will, uh, it's not uncommon for people to stay up real late on the weekends celebrating, uh, particularly young people. They will do this and then they throw off their sleep cycle. And then, then we have 
them tired during the week because they're not getting enough sleep and they're not getting enough sleep, then they're not going to exercise, they're not going to exercise. And the whole process of support for their self-esteem uh, and, and the dissipation of, of sort of nervous anxiety and stress that will take place under exercise, these processes don't take place well. And now we're a little anxious and a little irritable and a little uncomfortable and a little tired and don't feel so good. And then if there is rich food and junk food in the house or anywhere else, then we go get it in order to get a little bit of relief. So this is, uh, people have heard me say that we don't eat for emotional reasons. And my discussion of that is related to deep emotional reasons from your history. You don't eat and have, uh, you don't have eating problems because of deep emotional reasons from your ancient history. But you do um, eat junky things and self-indulgent things for, quote, emotional reasons. And the emotional reasons being the mild irritations and frustrations that we are trying to get a little bit of break from. By, by using uh, food, particularly rich food, in a, in a pharmacological, as a pharmacological short-term tool. And our nervous system will, will let us do this because... It essentially uh, living in a stone age body with a stone age brain, the nervous system says, you know what, if we can eat a little something that's rich, it's probably a good idea uh, because we don't know if we're going to have food tomorrow. So it will always give us a little dopamine rush and a little endorphin glide to, uh, for a few minutes to feel like we did something productive. Uh, but that's part and parcel of the systematic overeating, which will contribute to the weight problem, which contributes to the self-esteem problem, which contributes to, you know, the mess that is one of the chief problems that people face. Right. So instead, we want to have routines, really good routines that we do repetitively, sleep, exercise, healthy food, over and over again. This is um, sometimes when um, Dr. Goldhammer and I have talked about these things, you know, for years and Dr. McDougall certainly, but um, we have an interesting reaction that we'll get from doctors when we explain our philosophy. And the reaction is an eye roll. <laughs> we will say, listen, this is what we recommend to people. They eat healthy food, they exercise, they get to sleep, and they don't use dietary drugs that stimulate them, like cigarettes, coffee, things of that nature. And we get an eye roll. Like, yeah, well, that's ridiculous. And yet, we have to say, folks, that this is how every single one of your ancestors lived. Without exception, every day of their life. So this is the baseline model for human nature. And we would expect in deviating from that model that there would be problems. And we see that there are. So these are, this is the simple underlying philosophy that sits underneath healthy living. And when we struggle with healthy living for any reason, we look back to this issue, uh, these very basic issues, stress from time pressure, getting things um, much more in balance with respect to our goals so that we have and do take the time to do things right on a consistent enough basis that we can stay in a deep groove and keep our submarine healthy. Uh, Dr. Lyle, yeah, those three things you mentioned, sleep, exercise, and you know, healthy food, healthy eating. When you really think about it, yes, in our modern time, all three are disrupted. I just, uh, just, kind of saw it, but I mean, you have presented it so clearly I mean, with the lighting and our phones and our computers, we go, don't go to sleep when we're supposed to. Yes. To exercise, yeah. we're sitting at a work, you know, not doing our, and then of course we have food all over the place available all the time. <laughs> <laughs> How can we win this situation? <laughs> Actually, I have to tell people that one of the things uh, that in, in late, in, in late uh, 18th century France, of course, you had the French Revolution and you had, you had people starving and they were finally fed up 
as they were finding out that that Louis the Fourteenth is eating, you know, this in unbelievably rich foods off of gold plates, and you know, finally, <laughs> that they just murdered the whole nobility. <laughs> this All was right. just a, a rage of starving people saying enough already. Mm -hmm. Now. We look back and some of us will roll our eyes at Louis the 14th eating off gold plates, but understand that we are eating a far richer diet than Louis. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. that, that Louis um, <laughs> had, he, he might have had uh, 30 or 40 cooks, but actually you have thousands. And it doesn't, it's not, not uh, it doesn't make any difference that they're not sitting around waiting for you to rise in the morning. The truth is, They've already done their job. It's at the store. Uh, it's yeah. at any of the restaurants from all over the world. People that know how to cook the cuisine of the world are, are have surrounded you, and they're within three or four miles of your house. So you, we actually, the average citizen now, 200 years later, um, lives far more indulgently than Louis XIV. It's completely out of control. <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> and, and we're looking at the result. We are. So we literally have a big, strong, what would be handsome men walking around looking like Henry VIII. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what, you know, they had to put that guy on a horse and a crane, for goodness sakes. This is what's happened. And there's reasons why it's happened. The reasons are uh, multidimensional. It's not going to be as simple mm -hmm. as, as uh, uh, meditation or putting your food on a smaller plate. Okay. So it's not going to be little tricks. It's going to be a comprehensive understanding of how much has changed in the environment and how diligently we have to adjust our habits away from the typical habits uh, into some very good routines that we use repetitively to defend us. Right. Because it does, I can see already here people, it sounds like we are doomed. <laughs> 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 yeah, we are not doomed, but we are challenged. We are challenged. And uh, and the people that make these changes and make them consistently, you get in a nice groove, and it doesn't mean you won't leave it, but when you're in it, you know, you know what? This is a really good way to live. Right. right. And uh, you can be enticed out of it, and you can be jostled out of it by stress, new relationships, excitement, opportunity. All kinds of things can jostle you out. But understand that this is a very good way to live and it's a good way to be aiming for and to be looking to make sure you put yourself in a position to be there. And I guess it matters uh, from person to person how much, what degree of unbalanced life they have, because I can see uh, people that, you know, they adopt this way of this change in dietary in, in eating and they do well and they stick to it most of the time. And then you have others that they, you know, they fall off, they come back on, fall off. And it, would that be a reflection of their other deeper issues of being things that go out of balance or what? I think there's um, th there can be a number of reasons. And I wouldn't say necessarily deeper. In other words, I wouldn't be going too deep with this. Right, right. Going a little deep. In other words, there could be their relationship between themselves, other people, their workplace, their kids, family, husband, wife, etc. There, there can be time pressures in some of their goals. So mm -hmm. very often goals will get us out of balance. And so that's an exciting part of that. But if it's if we stay out of balance too long, then we can get into trouble. So uh, even if you're, suppose somebody's gonna go back to school and take an accounting course because one day they wanna be a CPA. Well, that's good and I'm excited for you. But be careful that that goal and the change of routine doesn't start putting pushing us too far out of balance. And if, we, if we're not well organized to do this, then what happens is pretty soon we're cramming for the final and we're cramming for the final. We don't have time to do our food right. We don't have time to exercise. We don't have time to sleep. And now we've got nothing but chaos. And now that chaos, we don't recapture a good routine even after the crisis is over. So right. Right. this is um, a respect for balance is a is a useful thing to have and probably more respect than we than we generally give it credit to and keeping that balance uh in many ways in sleep food exercise uh it's keeping that balance on a very good routine 
not getting greedy by trying to cram too much into our lives too quickly uh, to reach some kind of goals of whatever kind that they might be. We can, uh, I've seen people uh, just as, as a, maybe a last comment. I, I've seen people that have very interesting stresses that 99% of people would, would roll their eyes and wonder that they could have such a stress. So I've had successful people determined to retire by the age of 50. And I've had people literally stressed out and pushing hard and out of balance and in trouble with respect to their health because they had the goal that they needed to be at some financial level X by the age of 50 because that was the goal that they set for themselves. And, you know, some guru told them to write your goals down and that that's how you're going to reach them and whatever. Like, this is ludicrous. <laughs> Why not 52? In other words, do a good process and let's not worry about trying to achieve that goal in a time frame that is somehow artistically or interestingly uh, pretty. You don't know how old you are. You don't count your summers. Uh, we, we do in the modern environment, but that's not part of nature. And so, and it's not part of nature really ever to retire. And so that, that's sort of a goal. I'm going to get done with my bachelor's degree by X, uh, no matter what. It's like, no, that doesn't make sense. Don't do it that way. So time pressure, uh, adding absurd pressures to, to uh, a lot of people, people trying to cram too much into too small a space. Uh, it's a little bit like trying to have a very orderly closet when you just have too much stuff in it. And when you have too much stuff in the closet, no matter how well organized it is, pretty soon it's going to be a problem. And that's the same thing with a life. Mm -hmm. Very good. Oh, man, that's a lot of <laughs> good thinking. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. I would like to remind everybody that you have a wonderful website. Um, and that you do one-on-one -on -one, uh, consultations uh, online or, or on the phone, I believe. So, uh, and, uh, can you tell us the website? Yes, uh, we now have esteemdynamics.com. Uh, so we now have the .com version of this. So oh, that's, good. That's we're telling people now, so we're sort of get everybody uh, switched over to that. But, okay. Uh, esteemdynamics.com, one word. And yeah, I'm there. And if people ever want to talk to me for half an hour or an hour, uh, they could just sign up. I, I make about, I, I make a few hours a week available and people can right. easily get an appointment. Wonderful, wonderful. I highly recommend it. And uh, we'll put it here on the screen later on. And um, we'll let people process all that you said and, and, uh, and come up with questions for our next webinar, maybe we can Fabulous. answer questions about this uh, very uh, intriguing and very uh, uh, wonderful topic that you have given us. Thank you, because getting out of balance. As a musician, I have to say, that's something that we talk about all the time. That, yeah. is, all, that is all we do. If you're in an orchestra, if you're in a, you play the piano, whatever, you're always talking about being in balance. And I yes. just find it interesting. To have a beautiful and fulfilling piece of art or music or life. Yes. Things have to be in balance. That's right. So perfect. Anyway. All right. Well, thank you again. And thank we you, will see Sarah. you in a few weeks. All right. Well, goodbye, everyone. We'll see you soon. Bye, folks.